well. Well, we're in uh, Ephesians uh, chap- chapter 4, uh, looking at verses 1 to 7. So we've kind of uh, turned a corner here, as we said. Uh, the book really divides at this point. First three chapters, doctrine, theology. Uh, the last uh, couple of chapters is more of the, the practical, uh, you know, how, how to live the, the, the Christian life. Uh, and this chapter is on uh, the call to, uh, to unity. Uh, we're going to uh, have the, this exhortation to walk in unity uh, in this passage and really continue down through uh, verse 16. He's going to use that same term uh, in chapter uh, 4, verse 17, where he ta- tells us to walk in purity. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 19, he'll use the same term and say it's important to walk in harmony. Uh, and then in the uh, last chapter, it'll be about walking in victory over the enemy in terms of uh, uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, and in terms of, uh, some people might ask, why, why does Paul do that? Why does he front load it with the doctrine and the theology, our understanding of God, our nature, our relationship with him? In this case, uh, a wonderful uh, explanation of our salvation there uh, in chapter 2 and so forth. Uh, why, why isn't he front loaded with how to live uh, you know, the, the Christian life, the practical stuff? Uh, and I think that uh, even with this message, you'll see the importance. It's important that you have the theology uh, before you have the practical. Uh, and especially it's true in this idea of unity uh, in the church. Warren Wordsby says, uh, says this, uh, uh, that the Christian life uh, is not based on ignorance but knowledge. I, I could probably stop right there. I, I, I like that line. Uh, and the better we understand Bible doctrine, the easier it is to obey Bible duties. When people say, don't talk to me about doctrine, just let let me live my Christian life, they're revealing their ignorance in the way the Holy Spirit works in the life of a believer. It makes no difference what you believe, just as long as you live right is a similar confession uh, of ignorance. It does make a difference what you believe, because what you believe determines how you behave. And so doctrine before before duty, uh, always uh, very important. And certainly here, uh, you'll notice that um, uh, it begins uh, with a therefore. Paul says, I therefore in verse one. So again, it's the therefore we have to look and see what it's there for. It's always a reference back to something else. And in this case, uh, as he begins to talk about this very practical issue of unity within the body of Christ, uh, he refers us instantly back to all those things that we've just been studying in chapters uh, one, two and three. That's why it's been very important that you've been here and looking at the, the following the images because Paul's saying, now that you know all these things, uh, now listen to this, uh, and this will make more sense. So we'll just, uh, oh, gee, there's no words anymore. What happened? So what was the first cha- half, half of chapter one, verses uh, one to 19 about? The master's card, which reminds us of the, the riches that we have in Christ. Some people are going to get an A on this final, I can tell already. The second uh, uh, half of chapter one uh, was about something else. Same plugged in, the power of God that is available to us. It's based on a relationship. We have to stay uh, plugged in. Uh, This should be about the easiest one here because there was such an awesome joke that I told to go along with it. Chapter 2, again, those first 10 verses, if you understand those two 10 verses, you can share the gospel and lead anybody to the Lord. It's all there in 10 verses. We're shaved by grace, okay? And then uh, uh, because of that, we then have peace with God. So we have access uh, with God. We've been brought uh, together with him, uh, which led us to then uh, an, an exhortation or discussion about the, something that was, uh, it was a mystery, but it's been revealed. What was the mystery? Jews and Gentiles together, both worshiping, worshiping God. That's how the, the makeup of the church, uh, which led to our, our message last week, uh, which was about the, the heart there. Just take a wild stab. That might be love. Again, the, it's a cross there. How about the love of God that's in Christ Jesus? And it was really about uh, that uh, there are certain things we could do uh, to give ourselves a greater capacity uh, to have God's love uh, in, our, in our own hearts. And, uh, and we uh, illustrated that by uh, one of the uh, Japanese superstars. And uh, 
You'll have to go back and get that message. You want to hear it. I, I struggled with this little picture, but the idea here is unity in the church. I think you see all those little people in there making, uh, making up the church, but that's where we are. Church is made up of a lot of different people, uh, and we have a charge here, point one, to uh, build unity in the church. Again, uh, reading from verse one. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Uh, so Paul right away. Again, there's this uh, a sense of urgency. He mentions that as a prisoner in the Lord, again, writing from, uh, from Rome. Uh, we got him there in the book of Acts in around 61, in the spring of 61 AD. It's probably in about the fall or so. Again, he reads, writes uh, uh, four different letters. We refer to them as prison epistles. This is uh, one of them. Uh, he uses the term, I beseech you, uh, again, indicating there's an urgency to, uh, to live for uh, God's glory. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, God would say, if you obey me, then I'll bless you. That was part of the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant said that to the Jewish people, as you go into the land, if you'll obey me, I'll bless you in, in the land. Uh, but the New Testament is very different. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, God tells us, I have blessed you <laughs> tremendously. Uh, and so now that, uh, that should be your natural response to uh, to want obey me. It's, uh, it's very, a very different relationship. We have old covenant, uh, new covenant, but again, there's, uh, there's an urgency here to what Paul is saying. Uh, and then that leads to the charge as a, a general principle stated for everyone. This is a very interesting verse that uh, is uh, uh, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Uh, that, that verse is literally a, a picture, and I, I want to show it to you. Uh, that word worthy is axiom or axios in the, in the Greek. It's using mathematical equations and you're doing algebra. You've got to keep applying equal to both sides to solve, solve the equation. Uh, it was used in the marketplace in the first century of this thing right here, a little scale. If you looked in the middle of it, the thing that's going to balance is the axiom. And Paul says there is a balance between two things if we're going to have unity uh, in the church of Jesus Christ. And on one side is our walk. We might say our walk has to match our talk. <laughs> the other side is our, our calling. So this, that verse right there was, says to walk or, or to really to live for Jesus Christ, very practical term. Uh, and the worthy is the balance in the middle. And the other side is the actual calling. Uh, uh, again, there's uh, 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 lots of exhortations in the New Testament uh, to talk about this idea of walking with the Lord. We've already mentioned a, a few here. It's walking in unity. I said by the time we get to verse 17 next week, it'll be walking in purity. Uh, and uh, uh, he says there are some very other important things about this idea of calling. So if calling is on the other side as believers, and there's supposed to be a balance between these two things, how our lives are really actually lived out out there in the real world, not just here on Sunday mornings, uh, what, is the, what is the calling on the other side? Well, let me just run through a few of them. In 1 Corinthians 1.9, uh, Paul says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship uh, of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So uh, part of the calling is into fellowship. So is, is my fellowship uh, and my calling, is that, is that an equal balance to how I actually live my life? How I live my life, is that a, is that a reflection, an even balance of uh, my relationship with Jesus Christ? Uh, Philippians 3.14, again, Paul says, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm called to heaven. I'm going there. We just sang a bunch of, bunch of songs about that. And, um, uh, and I would say also, I can tell any time Mark's had a tough week because there's a lot of songs about, uh, about heaven. Good reminder of us all is part of our calling. <clears throat> so in that balance, how I live my life is balanced. The worthy is a balance with my perspective that I'm actually on my way to heaven. Is that what other people see uh, in my own heart and life and attitude? Is that balanced or is it kind of like <laughs> uh, we're out of balance there? Uh, it's more than that. 1 Corinthians 126, again, Paul writing using the same term. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
But God has chosen the foolish thing of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. In other words, God didn't call us because we were so awesome. It was kind of the opposite of that. Uh, so I would say, uh, do, is our life worthy, is our walk worthy of a position of humility uh, and thankfulness that God has actually uh, called us? So again, this, this is what Paul is, is saying uh, is a very intricate part of, if we've kind of got a balance in this, then we're going to be able to have unity in the church. Uh, and if we're not, we might be having problems if, uh, if people are not the same way in church as they are at home. If they're not the same way in church uh, as they are at work. If they're not the same around believers and unbelievers. If, there's, if this thing gets out of, out of balance, uh, there's something wrong with our lives. Uh, we're not really seeing our calling uh, in Jesus Christ. We're not worthy. We're not, we're not balanced. Uh, that's the picture, uh, and certainly that's uh, the first uh, message that we, uh, that we see here. And it's important uh, because uh, it's something that the world is, is dying for. You know, again, when, when we say uh, unity, maybe that's a, a big term, and we'll, we'll talk about the doctrinal aspects of that. Paul gets to that. That's his, uh, his third point uh, in this section. Uh, we could just express it this way. Uh, do people really see us as a family? Uh, and is that what they experience when they, when they come in uh, to our presence? And we can talk about the body of Christ and unity and, you know, in, in, our, you know, in the state and in the country and worldwide. But just to make it more practical uh, for this morning, though, we'll, we'll discuss some of those issues. Uh, do people really sense this idea of ohana or family when they, when they come into our midst? Uh, because, as I said, uh, people are really struggling uh, for, for this issue uh, we live in what um, one writer called uh, a um, elevator culture. You know, you get in the elevator and it's just eyes forward, don't say a, a word. You know, if you say something, it's like people ignore you or they think you're weird or whatever. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, a couple of, just a couple of statistics. Uh, a 2006 study of 3,000 women with breast cancer found that those with a large network of friends were four times more likely to survive as women with a sparser social connection. A French study that monitored nearly 17,000 utility workers revealed the degree of their social interaction was a good way of predicting who would be alive at the end of the decade. A study involving 3,000 Americans found that people with close friendships are far less likely to die young. And another study found that 50-year-old uh, men with active friendships are less likely to have heart attacks than solitary men. And you thought it was what you ate. <laughs> Listen, all this to say is that uh, uh, God made us to, uh, to be together uh, and not to be, uh, not to be uh, isolated. Uh, there was a, an 80s uh, kind of a, a theme song that went with the show of that day with the lyrics that said... Uh, uh, making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. And where was that? A bar. <laughs> and it's the reason a lot of people go there as far as neighborhood bars and stuff. The, um, I read a story uh, uh, a few years ago in the uh, UPI story about a man named John J. Davis. He was 58 years old. He set his wheelchair on fire. Uh, he said he was rescued. Uh, the reason he gave was, he said, to get attention. Uh, I read about another young man who would go get his hair cut once a week. And he says it was so he could experience the touch of another human in a non-threatening manner. Uh, people. People cr crave, you know, really actually what we have, you know, here, here as, uh, as believers. Again, an elevator world where everybody keeps their eyes forward. But there's a craving for this idea uh, of unity. Uh, and the way that people recognize it and come into it if, is if there's a balance. If, the, if we're worthy in terms of uh, 
how we live our lives, our walk, and our actual calling that's going to lead to, uh, to unity. So there's a charge to unity. And we get there, again, by understanding the first three chapters of, uh, uh, of Ephesians. Uh, but there's character that goes along with it. Uh, that's in verses 2 and 3. With all lowliness and gentleness, uh, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So there's five character traits mentioned. The first is uh, lowliness. Uh, we might uh, often translate that word humility. Uh, something despised in the Greek world of the first century. The Greek world of the first century is very, very, very similar to, to our world today. When I was a, a kid growing up in the 50s, what was esteemed was humility. And, you know, I've mentioned that before. That's what, so when uh, athletes would be interviewed, they would be actually kind of bashful uh, about uh, their successes. And it would all be, you know, well, we... You know, we did our best, and this is after winning the Super Bowl or something. The guy that's the MVP, or, you know, it'd be, you know, but, you know, we had a, we had a great coach and tremendous uh, teammate. I mean, these guys would be very bashful, very shy, because humility was actually esteemed. And it's not, it's not anymore. I don't know if you've noticed that with sports, sports figures. Uh, even if they uh, make a good play, they like to do a little dance, call attention to themselves. I don't really uh, understand that when you're down by 14 points and you're still doing that kind of stuff. But, uh, uh, you know, some strange things that go on in uh, modern-day athletics. Uh, but uh, we're like the first century world uh, that Paul is writing in here uh, in terms of uh, of this idea of the self-sufficiency of man. That was, the, again, the Greek, the Greek culture uh, at the time, very similar to uh, how it is today. Uh, humility uh, can be best understood by the acronym JOY, uh, Jesus, others, and then you last. Uh, that's that's uh, humility. Uh, Paul says in Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your own opinion. And that's hard to do because we live in a, a very self-centered world. I like this definition of humility. That's humility means uh, knowing ourselves, accepting ourselves, and being ourselves uh, to, to the glory of God. You know, somebody uh, is a fabulous guitar player and somebody says, man, that was awesome. You're such a good guitar player. Uh, it's okay to say, Thank you. <laughs> As a, no, it's really nothing. No, actually, the guy's awesome. You know, it's just you know, it's accepting who you are, but for for the glory of God, it's not a, a this kind of false presentation that you put uh, on to, to to everyone. Uh, humility, so important. You know, it's uh, it's important to your own relationships, right? I mean, uh, it's no fun trying to be friend uh, friendly with somebody that's full of pride, right? Uh, the opposite of that, a guy that's humble, it certainly makes it a lot easier. Uh, certainly makes it a lot easier to have unity uh, in the church. Secondly is gentleness. Uh, being gentle or, or meek is another term that's uh, translated for that particular uh, Greek word. Uh, we see it used of Moses, who was uh, uh, referred to as the meekest man on the planet. Very powerful guy. Uh, and that's a definition, a good definition of meek. It's power uh, under control. Uh, it's used uh, of Jesus. In fact, Jesus uses it of himself. Uh, when he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think that might be the only autobiography, bi biographical statement that Jesus makes about himself. The one time Jesus describes himself, he says he is gentle and humble uh, in heart. Uh, the Holy Spirit is working in us as believers to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, right? We, with all unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image. He says it's, it's a work of the Spirit. So it would be the natural thing for believers as they mature in Christ to become more, more gentle uh, and more humble. It, it's a a fruit of the Spirit. Paul says in Galatians 5.22 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. Uh, so again, these are not things where, where uh, I, I somehow contrive to be like this. If I'm just walking <laughs> in a way that's worthy, uh, these are just going to be the characteristics 
that the Holy Spirit develops in my life. Uh, and this will all lead to, uh, to unity. Uh, uh, again, humble and gentle certainly goes a long ways in terms of uh, getting along with other people. Third is long-suffering, or sometimes translated patient. Uh, it literally means uh, uh, long-tempered. It, uh, it means it takes a lot to, for you to hit your boiling, boiling point. And there's, there's probably some things that get, that get us going a little uh, quicker than others. Uh, uh, today's Living Bible translates that verse saying, make an allowance for each other's faults because of, of your love. Uh, so it's, uh, it's allowing, it, it's acknowledging uh, that we, we all don't agree on everything, and that's okay. Unity is not conformity. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in, to a church where, where pretty much everybody dressed the same, their hairstyles were the same, they wore the same kind of shoes. and all. That's a little scary. I, I, I've, I've been in a few churches like that. It's, it's a little scary. Uh, that's uh, uniformity. That's, that's not necessarily unity because this is all about heart uh, attitude and the way we respect others and so forth. The church that I, that I grew up in, uh, had uh, at one point in time, when I think it was in about junior high school, uh, they had an opportunity uh, to sell their older building that was kind of in a downtown area and move outside the city a little bit uh, up on the hills overlooking the city, beautiful location, and, and build, build a new facility, which they did, and it was, uh, it was beautiful. But there was almost a church split in the process. You can imagine all the decisions that have to be made uh, in constructing a new facility, but you're going to be amazed and what the split almost came over. It came over the type of wallpaper and the color of wallpaper used in the women's bathroom. Now people did leave the church, several families, over that decision. It almost split the whole church in two. And, and I could give you other stories that are similar over similar issues. Uh, Dwight Pentecost used to tell the story about uh, uh, two churches in a small town that actually went to court uh, uh, because they split and they couldn't figure out who would get the property. And, and the, and the uh, secular court system says, I better you, we're not going to do this. You better take this back and try to figure it out among yourselves. Uh, they got some uh, other guys from the outside, some Christian leaders, to try to help uh, settle the dispute, which is a good idea. It all boiled down to one of the elders felt like, the slice of ham that he got at a church picnic was not as thick as a kid sitting next to him. It's not a made up story. The whole church was about ready to split over the whole issue. Hey, when I was building stained glass windows for a living, I'd go into certain situations. I, I did a lot of, uh, I, I did many churches and, um, uh, and everything. And of course, I, I love doing that because it, it gave me a chance to, uh, for a you know, direct expression of my own faith in terms of uh, the artwork and so forth. Christ stained glass, by its origination and definition, is a Christian art form. Uh, and uh, so that was always, uh, always fun. Uh, but it was always uh, kind of crazy because I would have to sit in then and present to church boards, you know, drawings and proposals and so forth. And, uh, and then in one case, these guys were just, they were kind of just verbally duking it out, fighting each other, you know. Uh, and, uh, and the pastor kind of had to take me on the side later and say, hey, I'm really, I'm really sorry for how all that went down. And then he explains, you see, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, this guy over here wouldn't agree with that gal over this issue of what she wanted to do. So that's why, because she likes your drawing, he doesn't. It really has nothing to do with your drawing itself. And this went on and on. And I, I just thought to myself, well, praise God, I'm, I'm glad it's me listening to all this. These guys are not going to stumble me in, in my faith. I'm glad it's not some of my friends that don't know the Lord uh, that are stained glass designers sitting in listening to all this. You'd never get them in a church after one of these discussions. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important topic. It's, uh, it's, not an easy, uh, it's not an easy deal. But long-suffering <laughs> go, goes a long ways. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Uh, fourth is bearing with one another in love, and that means to put up with each other because you do love them. Uh, and again, that's got to be the, uh, you know, if we, if we go back to our previous text last week, a very important doctor was saying, there's actually some things we can do to enlarge our, ourselves in terms of being able to contain uh, more of the love of God, and we certainly need that. Uh, secondly, unity requires more than character, and that's in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And here, this is actually a, a command. The word endeavoring means to wrestle. In other words, it's not easy 
<laughs> uh, it's, uh, the verb is a present participle, which means it's a constant endeavor. So in other words, we, we have to kind of be uh, working at it all the time, apparently, to, uh, to maintain unity uh, and, uh, because it's a spiritual unity. Uh, it's, uh, again, it doesn't mean we agree on everything, uh, but it does mean uh, it's a spiritual dynamic uh, within our relationships uh, with each other. And if you're counting and keeping track, which I think only the teenagers are that are taking notes, you're wondering where, where was that fifth characteristic? Well, that's in v uh, verse three. I've kind of separated here. Unity requires the character of a peacemaker. Verse three, uh, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. A uh, few things about, uh, about peacemakers themselves, and one is that uh, a peacemaker is, is honest. He's honest about relationships and uh, what's going on. We might in the vernacular say uh, uh, it's somebody that doesn't just sweep things under the rug. And uh, I wouldn't want to use that expression in a foreign country and watch the person translating say to me, under what rug? But uh, <laughs> I think you know what I mean. Ezekiel puts it this way, a couple of Old Testament references to this idea, pretending that there, there's really not anything there when there really is. Uh, he says, because indeed, because they have seduced my people saying peace when there is no peace, and one builds a wall and they plaster it with untempered mortar, uh, say to those who plaster it with untempered mortar that it will fall. Hey, that's a great looking building you got there. I think it's going to fall apart any day. Oh, it looks awesome though, you know. And uh, he's saying that's what's going on in Israel. That's, that's not a peacemaker. Peace, peace when there is no peace. Jeremiah says much the same thing in Jeremiah 6, 14. Uh, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying peace, peace when there is no peace. Now, the guy's got a gash in his arm. They put a Band-Aid on it. Hey, brother, it's going to be okay. <laughs> peace, peace. When there, when there is no peace. Uh, it's, uh, a peacemaker is uh, uh, a difficult position to be in. It, I, it's hard to do, uh, but it's somebody willing to be honest uh, when there's something wrong in a relationship with somebody else. Uh, is being a peacemaker then uh, the same thing as, as uh, honesty at any cost? Uh, I just thought you should know that new hairstyle looks horrible. I'm just being honest with you. That's not what we're talking about here. That's not what we're talking about. It's not that kind of honesty. Because uh, the motivation for everything is love. Uh, in love, uh, should I say, could I say something that will make our relationship better? Uh, peacemaking is uh, a difficult thing. Uh, secondly, peacemaking uh, is someone who's willing to risk pain. Kind of goes along with the first idea. Because sometimes when you attempt to be a peacemaker, you risk being misunderstood and you risk uh, failure. It means willing to apologize uh, when you're wrong. It means willing to rebuke someone when they need to hear it privately, lovingly, uh, and uh, with a lot of prayer uh, behind it. Listen to what James says about being a peacemaker in James 3.17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we can still agree to disagree on a lot of things and still have uh, unity. And, uh, and this is, uh, is certainly essentially true in terms of, of the, the body of Christ, not just within, within a local church. Uh, if, we're, if, if we're all pretty much in agreement theologically, and that's one of the reasons that, that we're here, uh, the, the other stuff we ought to be able to handle. Uh, there, there are certainly issues that we are, say, are non-eternal issues that we should be able to agree to disagree over uh, and still see ourselves as brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. Again, more of the, uh, that doctrinal issue uh, uh, in here in a moment. But, but again, the charge to build, uh, how do we get there? It's by understanding chapter 1, 2, and 3. If we don't understand the basic issues of salvation in chapter ten, uh, 2 in those first 10 verses, if we don't understand that uh, uh, Jews and Gentiles are supposed to be together worshiping God, there's a, supposed to be this tremendous diversity within the body of Christ. Uh, if we don't understand the riches that we have in Christ Jesus and so forth, uh, we'll never get to the character that actually builds uh, unity uh, within the church. Third is the confessional truth that unity is based on. So now he kind of gets back to this uh, very important doctrinal uh, issue. Uh, because uh, there are some that would say, 
unity at, uh, at any cost. Uh, but uh, Paul, Paul would never, never go along with that. Are you going to be able to have, uh, be, have unity or fellowship with every person that calls themselves a Christian? No, because there's a lot of people that call themselves Christian, uh, and they're not, uh, and, and, and they're not even, not even close to it. I saw an interview uh, that was from a few years ago uh, of the, uh, a pastor who uh, uh, purports to be uh, the pastor of the largest church in the United States at the time, uh, and he's being questioned uh, on a secular talk show uh, about Mormonism and whether, whether we are uh, brothers and sisters and part of the church with, with Mormons. Uh, and basically, uh, he said, uh, well, you know, as long as they love Jesus, uh, you know, and uh, Jesus is important to them, then, yeah, I consider them my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Yeah. I'm sorry, but that's a different Jesus. It's a different gospel uh, and so forth. Uh, I, I, he's striving for unity. Paul would never ask us to do that for unity. Uh, and he inserts very importantly, again, not only chapters 1, 2, and 3 that say here's the basis doctrinally, uh, but now this very important truth uh, that is about the Trinity itself, that's in verses 4 to 6. Uh, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, or as we sometimes say, y'all. But uh, for uh, uh, again, some of the remarks that are sometimes made when we bring up the subject of unity, uh, we're not interested in doctrine, but in love. Uh, now let's forget our doctrines and just love one another. That, that's not, Paul's not saying that, that here. Uh, unless we build uh, the unity that we have on anything other than biblical truth, we're always going to be on a shaky, shaky foundation. So Paul names some uh, spiritual realities that unite all, all true, true Christians. Uh, and they're uh, tied, we'll see, uh, with this idea that some believe that this was, uh, again, a hymn sung by the early church, uh, this uh, doxology of sorts. Uh, it's based on the confessional truth that indicates what we believe about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he says there's one body. Speaking of the body of Christ, each member is a uh, uh, is a believer and brought into the body of Christ. When we pray to receive the Lord, we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins. Uh, he brings us into uh, the body of Christ. Uh, he talks about this in, in writing to the church in Corinth where he says, for as the body is one, it has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, where their slaves are free and all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not uh, one member, but uh, many. So uh, when we come to faith in Christ, uh, we are brought into uh, the, uh, uh, the body of Christ because the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within each of us uh, at the time that we pray to receive the Lord. So he says there's one spirit. Holy Spirit creates the body of Christ. He's the one that draws us, convicts us, conforms us, empowers us as believers. It's the same Holy Spirit that uh, indwells every believer. So all of us belong to the Lord and all of us belong to the, to the body of Christ. So on the subject of, uh, of unity, unity is not something we try to uh, contrive or make happen. It just is. <laughs> all, all believers, uh, true believers, uh, all over the world today and through all the centuries, have all been members of the body of Christ. We are all united together. We have the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that convicted us of our sins, that brought us to the Lord, uh, that works in our hearts to conform us to the image of Jesus. It's the same for all of us. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing uh, when we can experience that essential commonality if we meet people uh, from around the world and, uh, and different places uh, within the body of Christ. Uh, secondly, the confessional truth, uh, confessional truth includes what we believe about the Son. Uh, there's no doubt when he says one Lord, he's talking about uh, Jesus here. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, uh, And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom uh, we live. <coughs> it's uh, uh, Jesus, uh, obviously, the Jesus of the New Testament is the Jesus we're talking about here. Uh, and there's one hope, uh, uh, church, uh, the true believers are looking for uh, the return of Jesus Christ, the hope that we have uh, in him. 
Uh, and again, it's Jesus that died for us, that lives for us, that will return for us one day. There's an acknowledgement here of his lordship. Uh, and then he says, and there is one faith. You know, there's a lot of ones uh, in this uh, couple of verses here. One faith. Again, this is a, a body of truth that uh, has once been settled, uh, that we're, uh, we're not looking for further revelations. We're not, uh, uh, we're not looking to add on to it. Uh, we, we have the scriptures already uh, in Jude 3. Uh, Jude summarizes it this way. Beloved, while I was uh, very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It was an issue in the first century that Christians had to be willing to defend their faith against those that would want to change it or alter it uh, in any way. And, we're, and we are still contending for that, uh, uh, that one faith. In fact, this whole idea of, of unity uh, led, led to a lot of uh, very interesting issues when it uh, became uh, really uh, uh, kind of the, the hallmark thing of the church in the 50s uh, and in the 60s. There was such, you know, there, there's a lot of diversity, you know, within the, within the body of Christ. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, and it's kind of fun at the same time. Uh, but uh, in the 50s and 60s, there were big councils that were developed uh, because the ecumenicalism to tr bring all tr uh, Christians together, all the denominations together uh, under, under one head and say, here's the essentials that we can agree on. And so an organization called the National Council of Churches was, uh, was developed because there was a concern that people were going to move as they were moving away from the uh, point of the inerrancy of Scripture itself and holding just to the Bible. Uh, with that then developed the World Council of Churches. In order to accommodate more and more churches, their view of scripture and essential doctrines started getting, getting uh, more and more shallow uh, and more and more out there uh, to where by the uh, early mid-60s, uh, none of the people in none of these groups were even Christian any longer. Uh, because they had sought to, you know, we, we've got we've to make it bigger for the sake of unity. And, and it's a real danger. Uh, when we first uh, started the church about 25 years ago, <clears throat> I met with about four or five guys for lunch once a month, once a month that were, uh, were pastors uh, uh, here, uh, here in Kailua. And uh, still, still two of those guys, guys around and uh, good friends. Uh, and and the, the deal was we'd, we'd get together once a month and we would never talk church stuff. <laughs> and we would never bring up doctrinal issues with each other. In, the es in essence, these guys were all, uh, were all on the same page uh, in terms of what we consider essential to be a Christian. Uh, the nature of God, that he exists uh, as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The nature of man, that we are sinners by nature. Uh, salvation only comes through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Jesus, who was fully God, fully man. I could kind of recite the Nicene Creed and, and cover all this, or the Apostles' Creed. But what we call the essentials in regards to salvation. There's lots of other stuff we differed on. We just chose not to talk about it. And what we did talk about was our own lives and our own personal a relationship with the Lord, and, and uh, we'd pray for our kids <laughs> and our marriages a lot and eat lunch. Uh, and we had just uh, a great, great time together for three or four or five years. And as happens, guys, uh, more in denominational settings kind of move over the years, and, uh, and, the, and that whole thing kind of uh, went, went away. Uh, it kind of regrouped again, and I tried to go for a while, but uh, again, in an effort to be inclusive. Uh, and to have, you know, it's, it's, uh, hey, if, if five is good, then 15 is better. <laughs> not, not necessarily. Uh, because if you start getting it so big that, that uh, I just got tired of going, I, I, don't, I don't think that's actually in the Bible. Uh, you know, I, I just hated being that guy all the time. Uh, it's, uh, Kevin's been to some of those, so he's laughing. Uh, you're just like, isn't this occurring to anyone else that I'm pretty sure this is not in the Bible? You know, whether it's a counseling technique or, or, or whatever it might be, uh, it just gets hard. Uh, Paul is not asking us to do that and abandon the faith for the sake of unity. Uh, is, is that pretty clear? That he leaves out three chapters of doctrine before he will ever even approach the subject. And even when he brings up the subject, he goes into this doxology that's all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about the Son, and it's all about the Father. It's like, if, we, if we're not on board with the faith, once handed down, 
which again is uh, derived from the New Testament, uh, based on everything we know from, from the Old Testament, God's word itself, uh, then uh, we're really not going to have unity with everybody. That's okay. That's not the object. Uh, it's, uh, it's really, really okay. It's actually something we need to uh, be on guard against. One baptism, he says. Again, we're talking about being, we're not, it's not a discussion of water baptism. It's not even a discussion of being baptized in the spirit. It's just, it's a discussion about being, being placed in uh, the, the body of Christ it, itself uh, as, uh, as believers. Uh, and then third, we get to the subject of the Father. This confessional truth includes what we believe about the Father. He says there's one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and uh, in all. So we have a unity in the church because, well, we have one Father. <laughs> we're, all, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, seven doctrinal statements uh, about the Trinity here. Uh, and uh, again, uh, what do I need to do to keep unity in the church? Well, again, as I said, we don't need to create it. It just is there. It, it already exists. Uh, and, uh, and it's based on the nature of God, that God is our Father. Therefore, it's eternal and it is unbreakable. Someone cannot break the unity in the body of Christ. They can choose to go off on a tangent. They can choose to go off and have their own little deal and their own little group, and, and that's okay. But uh, Christians through the centuries are united because of our salvation in Jesus Christ and because God uh, is our, our Father. Now, on the, on the, uh, the back of our bulletin, uh, and I, I, I probably should have looked. I, didn't. I, I assume it might still be there. Yes, it is. Uh, there's a little, uh, little statement there that says, somewhere there. I can almost memorize it. Uh, down about the, uh, the third line from the top says, we're, we're not a denominational church, nor are we opposed to denominations as such. Only their overemphasis of the doctrinal differences that have led to the division of the body of Christ. Uh, in, in terms of, I can just tell you, most of the denominations that are out there are all divided over two doctrines. And, and certainly we, we cover them and we talk about them. Uh, and one we covered uh, pretty extensively in chapter one. Uh, there are a whole group of believers that believe we're saved by our own free will choice. Uh, there's another group that believes that we're, it's all predestined and, and you have nothing to do with your salvation. It's all predetermined. Uh, wh why do they hold those position? Because the Bible teaches that. Why do these guys hold it? Because the Bible teaches that. But these guys hold that and ignore that teaching. These guys hold the free will choice and ignore that, that teaching. That's why we're, we're kind of in the middle of this. When we come to passages that teach us free will choice, we teach free will choice. When we come to a passage that te teaches gloriously how God has uh, you know, called us before the creation of the world, uh, we take great delight and joy to know that uh, God, God has, uh, has done that as well. Uh, but you have denominations that have split and then emphasize those, those doctrines uh, to the, the detriment in terms of any kind of unity in the body of Christ. The other doctrine, there's really only two, uh, is, uh, is the idea, are the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we, we saw and demonstrated in the book of Acts that Paul writes extensively uh, about uh, in, in the New Testament, and how they're to be function and regulate it and names them and so forth. Uh, did they, there's one group that believe they ended at the time of the apostles. They're called cessationist. Uh, then you've got other groups that um, are, uh, they're called charismatic because the gift is from that word charisma. Uh, and so they, they believe the gifts are for today. So there's a, and, and, and here we are in, in the middle of again. <laughs> Uh, it's like uh, we, uh, we certainly don't believe they ended at the time of the apostles based on the scriptures. Uh, we recognize that on this side, you've got within the charismatic movement, you've got uh, Pentecostalism. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so these guys see an extreme, so they kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, sometimes these guys are so extreme, we hate to be identified with them. So sometimes we're like, we're, we're kind of, uh, we make up our own word. We're non-cessationist. You know, it's just, it's like, you know, because there's, there's some crazy stuff going on over here. We don't exactly want to be identified with those guys, but we believe in the truth of God's word. 
that uh, uh, God gives us gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are to be exercised. They are to be used. There's nothing in Scripture that says they're going to be cut off at uh, some point in time. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, uh, the opposite is true. Paul uh, starts in that section of 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 12 uh, where he says, uh, uh, Now, brothers, about spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. Unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorance on, on, on that subject. Uh, and uh, uh, as he, as he uh, uh, squeezes in the middle, not coincidentally, chapter 13, uh, and talks about love, because if you don't have this, these gifts are meaningless. And he gets to chapter 14. He says, uh, follow the more excellent way and desire and seek after, eagerly, excuse me, eagerly desire and seek after spiritual gifts. Uh, so it's like... Uh, how do you get verses like that, but yet that's actually done? Uh, ignorance and not seeking after, but then the extreme because biblical guidelines are, are not followed. So in the bigger picture, sometimes it's a little difficult to have unity unless, unless we can simply agree to disagree on some of these things. And if people have these characteristics, it can be done. Uh, and, it's, and it's a great thing. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I went to... Uh, uh, the graduate school is a school that doesn't exist. It didn't close down because of me. Uh, it's, not, it's actually happened after I left, but uh, it's all financial stuff. But uh, it's tough to do uh, here in the islands, but uh, it was international college and graduate school. And, you know, it was fun for me because there were people there from, you know, I, did, I didn't know that uh, uh, you know, there were any Lutherans that really knew the Lord, but there really are. <laughs> And they, they're very quick to designate themselves as the Missouri Synod because they still believe in the uh, inerrancy of Scripture. They're evangelical and so forth because there's a lot that don't anymore. Yeah, it was just fun being in all, all these different uh, people, different backgrounds and having very spirited debates theologically. But in the end, being able to agree to, to disagree on subjects. I also I always liked uh, going... Uh, into church history <clears throat> with Dr. Bon Ro, who's a, a, a Korean, but was a missionary for 30 years uh, and uh, uh, speaking Chinese. So he would start his class and says, well, let's sing, let's sing, a, let's sing a, a, a chorus together before we begin. First, Chinese, and then he would sing it uh, in Cantonese, uh, and then he would say, Japanese, and there was there's people in the class that sing it with him in Japanese, and then uh, what was his other language? He would do about Korean, of course. And then there was always Korean students. Korean! He sang the whole thing in Korean. I'm just waiting. <laughs> Finally, English. Hallelujah. I get to sing along. But uh, <laughs> it was very international and very multi, uh, multi-denomination. Uh, and, and it was a blast to, to see the distinctions and the differences. But there still could be unity. If you have these characteristics, the, the humility, the meekness, uh, if these things are, are built, if you're, uh, you're, you don't have a short fuse, you've got a long fuse because you, you love others. Uh, there really can be unity uh, in, in the body of Christ. Uh, and after all, uh, this is what uh, uh, Jesus uh, prayed for in John 17, 21. What we call his highly, high priestly prayer for the church. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, here's the reason, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, or mature, complete, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus is saying that, uh, it's going to be difficult for the world to know uh, that the Father sent him uh, and, that, uh, and that, uh, that God loves us uh, if that love isn't demonstrated uh, uh, one, one for another. A couple things here uh, just to close uh, practical tips for uh, unity. One, uh, we must realize there's a, a doctrinal standard that's the basis for true unity. Okay, so there's just... We're not going to be able to really have unity with everybody. Even if they call themselves a Christian, have Jesus in the, in the name on the door somewhere or something, uh, there, there, is, uh, there is a certain doctrinal standard that's uh, uh, got to be met in order for there to be uh, unity. Uh, in the essentials, the essentials that have to do with salvation, uh, non-essential things, uh, hey, we can agree to, uh, to disagree. Uh, we need to ask the Holy Spirit, secondly, to help us cultivate 
the right attitude towards others. <clears throat> we need to pray for humility, gentleness, patience, uh, and bearing with one another uh, in love. And if I fall into sin in these areas because I don't do this, I need to repent of my sin, ask the Lord to forgive me, and in some cases maybe go to another person and ask to be forgiven uh, as well. Uh, three, uh, make every effort to be a, a peacemaker. Uh, admit it when there's not peace. Uh, take steps to achieve peace. Uh, as Paul says in Romans 12, 18, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Uh, it's, it's not always possible. Uh, Paul acknowledges that. As much as it depends on you, as much as you can try to pull it off, uh, you should try to be a, a peacemaker. And as we kind of started the message, uh, the reason is because uh, it's a lonely world that's out there. People are alienated from, uh, from each other. And Paul says, but in the church, there's a new humanity where peace and love and acceptance are, are to reign. And uh, so important that uh, we listen to the prayer of Jesus in this, uh, understand the, the need for unity uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, it's, again, it's not unity at, at any cost, uh, but uh, uh, there are certainly a bunch of folks around the planet today uh, that we can have uh, unity with. We don't have to try to make it happen. It exists. Uh, we just have to be very urgent. Paul says that endeavor like a wrestling match to uh, maintain the unit. It's not easy, uh, but uh, that's what we're called to do. Amen? Let's pray. Lord.